<laughs> in one moment, gay boy came up to me and said, you couldn't hold hands in New York in the 60s? I'm like, uh, no, they put you in jail is what they do. You didn't even go to a gay bar. There were very few, but you wouldn't do that because a police would burst in, take you to jail. I mean, today they're winning Emmys. They're four feet off the ground. They're flying and they're getting <laughs> Emmys. But in those days, you better not even give a hint. The phrase was, Oh, he's too light in the loafers. Right. You had to butch it up as much as possible. Try and, try, yes, how are you? I'm glad to see you, yes. Uh, uh. Through my and life. And you were in New York during Stone, Stonewall? Yes, before uh-huh. Stonewall. I moved there in 62, Stonewall was 69. I, there was, I didn't exist then. The only place that I could really get consistent work was doing stand-up comedy, and I had this crazy look, and I had been on Star Search and the Merv Griffin show and a couple of those half-hour comedy shows. And I had been making a little bit of a my name for myself. But all of a sudden, when the 90s hit, I had nowhere to go artistically in my act. All of a sudden, like I, I used to say, I had a joke, I said, girls don't find me sexually stimulating. I don't know why, <laughs> you know? And I would do all these jokes, and I had this crazy hair, and these leopard jackets, and zebra mm-hmm. pants, and I'd mm-hmm. dance in a jackets, circle, and yes. you know, and, and because I didn't want anybody to know I was gay. I thought that, that would, you know, it, it was the era of Emo Phillips, and Judy Tenuta, and Pee Wee Herman, and it was the era of these characters, that's what I was trying to do. And I don't think I really ever succeeded, because I look at stuff, and myself, and what all I see is fear. I think uh, gay rights uh, have advanced a lot more than Latino rights. And that is because the gay community is really vocal and very strong. And the other thing is that um, gay people have money, especially non-Latino gays have a lot of money. I took a long time to become a Latino activist and a gay activist because I didn't have to once I was in New York. The Latino thing there, nobody really cared. Mm -hmm. And... I was in musical theater, so, you know, and and it's been a source of embarrassment that everyone I now know, they were marching, you know, when they were 20, and I'm like, but you know what, I'm thinking, if I lived in a Texas border town, I probably would have been marching, Mm -hmm. or had I stayed in L.A., but I didn't. Mm -hmm. So for 20 years, I was completely, neither issue was a thing to me. I was just about showbiz, that was it. The first such gigantic march, like 87, I think, Cesar Chavez was one of those carrying the lead banner, and he spoke at that. Wow. At that rally. Most people don't even don't know that. About that. No. I think I was like, I, I wouldn't say suicidal, but just like, man, I, was, I, I thought about going to New York and pretending I was somebody else. Because in those days, there was no connection between coasts. I just thought, I can't be this person. And I never wanted to be a joke. And I love Paul Lynn. I love Charles Nelson Riley and Rip Taylor and all those guys. I bowed to them. Because if it weren't for them, I wouldn't have been, been able to be here. Because they were the beginning of that. But I didn't want that career. It was really hard because that was the only that career that, they... that was the only career that they were going to give me, and that career was ending. But... Jim J. Bullock was the last of those neutered gay guys, so I thought the only way to do this were to come out and have power. So the joke would be mine; they would not be able to laugh at me. I was on the board of directors of Outfest, the Gay and Lesbian mm-hmm. Film Festival in L.A. Which is the biggest, one of the biggest yes, film festivals yes, in the country. Yes, it's been country. around forever. I was on the board of directors of GLAAD, mm-hmm. the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation. I attended some of those dinners where people were giving, you know, tens and thousands of dollars for the cause. So yes, that makes them very strong and they are able to mount uh, great campaigns. Also, there has been the will and graces of the world that have changed the opinion of, of America as to who gay people are. I started by having two lists. First time I realized I was something called a Mexican. First time I realized I was gay. First time I felt, you know, marginalized as a Mexican. And it's again, they all had stories attached to them. And then I started to mix the stories up. And that's how Gay Tina was born. So I'm going to talk about something that happened in my life as a gay person that you might not relate to. I have to find a way, if the whole audience is straight, I have to find a way that you will understand it. Having a Jewish mom, how you will, everybody has a mom. One of my key values is self-love. And that came, became clear to me later in life as I realized that I had uh, lived my life it, with self-loathing. I grew up as a, as a gay man in a Latin household that, where it was not, not right. So I grew up with a lot of abuse and I grew up with internalized self-hatred, which led me to actually uh, be a victim of a drive-by shooting here in Los Angeles when I first moved here. In the middle of the night, outside my apartment, some car came up and shot me. But what really happened after that was I did a lot of soul searching and I did a lot of healing. And what really came up was that I had been living my life crisis to crisis to crisis to crisis based on self-loathing. So I was really creating 
all those crises based on the lack of love I had for myself. So I began to work on loving myself. Every actor must do self-care. No matter how talented you are, how gifted you are, how thespian of it all you are, if you don't take care of yourself, you're not gonna be anything. That's right, you gotta take care of yourself. That means being well balanced. That means eating well, making sure you're hydrated. So put your name, your email address, hit the button, and I'll send you my little checklist on how to do self-care for actors. Go ahead, what you waiting for? You came out in 80 when the AIDS epidemic yes. was starting to uh, uh, ravage right. the community. Literally, literally. Because like by 85? Oh yeah. 85 I, I, I had... lost my first friend to AIDS in about 83 or four, and Carlos died in 89. Yeah, so the, those 80s were you can't even imagine them unless you live through them. Yeah, you know, a young gay boy. A lot of oh men doing that. A lot of men in our circle. Sure, you, you couldn't know? keep track. I remember I'd be talking to my friend in New York, and they say, you know, Terry died. I'm like, oh my God, well, wait a minute, but didn't he die three weeks ago? No, that was Bill. Oh, Bill, that's a. You couldn't keep track. Yeah, it was you horrible. just couldn't keep track. It, was, it was like this cloud that was not only losing people, but the hush about it. Roy London was my teacher for like nine years. And when he got sick, the only reason I knew was because his housekeeper was cleaning house to a friend of mine who was also one of his students. And then we would just call him and leave him messages mm -hmm. and just tell him we loved him. And yeah. But nobody talked about it. No. Nobody shared, nobody. So, so, you, so people would all of a sudden disappear and then they were dead. And, and they didn't know what it was, don't yeah. forget, for a good, yeah. what, a, maybe a year or two. They didn't even know what it was, the gay cancer, whatever the hell it was, but they didn't know what it was. And then they were saying things like the incubation period could be 20 years. Well, who hadn't had unsafe sex in 20 years? Never mind what it did to the artistic community, mm -hmm. all that talent. We lost a, a whole generation of artists and performers and musicians and writers, an entire generation. And the first thing I did is I got on stage and I said, look, okay, so they don't want the gays, they don't want the Jews, they don't want the blacks, the Hispanics, the Asians, they don't want us here. Got it, got it. We're not supposed to be here. Where are we supposed to go? Are we going to Europe? I love Europe. Is someone paying for it? If they're paying for it, do I bring a sweater? Is it gonna be cold? What do I need to pack when I bring more than one bag? I'm not going on Southwest because I hate those three lines. Is it United States? Are we staying in the United States? Maybe we should stay here. Maybe we should go to North and South Dakota. No one's using it. I'm gonna tell you right now, I'm not staying at a Motel 8. I don't care. Not Motel 8 or 6, nothing with a number, but I will air be it. Loving yourself can be it's such a, well, what does that mean? I can just tell myself, I love myself, I love myself, I love myself. It's a lot deeper than that because it's not here, it's here. It's when you feel it in your heart. And then when you go inside and you, as a self, if you have self-loathing, you go inside and you take a look at what's in there, it's scary. And so I started to, you know, really work on self-love. Self-love is really the key to living a good life. And everything that happens in your life happens as a result of you loving or not loving yourself. That's really the key to the experience in your life. So you must love yourself in order to create some good experiences for yourself.